This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch. Tim Dahl, episode number 132. Yes. How you doing? Perfect as always. I'm uh, rather happy with this little bit of this little tidbit of news. The the Insurrection Index, in case you didn't know, it does exist. The Insurrection Index has identified 1,011 individuals in positions of public trust, including current or former government employees who played a role in the former president's bid to hold on to power despite his election loss, as well as 393 organizations that were determined to have taken part in Trump's attempt to overthrow the election. Now, the index, which went live on the one year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, includes 147 members of Congress who objected to the certification of Biden's election, as well as state legislators, school board members and other elected officials across the U.S. who questioned the election result or took steps to impede certification. What is wrong with these? Well, the latest, most ridiculous of Trumpism is that (laughs) the cues are now saying he might actually be a clone. Oh, yes. This was uh, as well. One of the heads, of, I forget his name, the head of Q or one of one of the main leaders of that movement had to. This was in Arizona, I believe I read. Uh, he had to settle down his uh, fellow Q's saying, <laughs> no, 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 I talked to Trump. It's actually him. But, you know, they don't really trust all these leader Q's because they come up with other things that don't pan out the way. They claim like the whole, well, yeah, the, well, the whole, well, the whole junior oh, and, and, and uh, I don't know, Rolling yeah. Stones thing. I, I don't know what something happened. Yeah. A, a bunch of dead rock stars were there as well. I, it's just so ridiculous. Well, speaking of one of the most ridiculous states in the union, which, as we know, is Florida, <laughs> a Florida teenager has been arrested on an attempted murder charge for allegedly ambushing a jogger. He had been stalking for weeks and trying to strangle him with a belt as part of a twisted plan to stash his lifeless body in a closet to fulfill his sexual fantasies. That's very Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, that's almost I mean, that's out of the Jeffy, Jeffrey Dahmer playbook. According uh, to court documents, an 18 year old Logan Smith's murderous plot failed when the victim turned the tables on him by using his martial arts training to fight him off and detain the suspect <laughs> until help arrived. So the deputies who responded discovered at the scene some of the items that Logan Smith had gathered in preparation for Uh the uh, attack on the unsuspecting jogger, which included a belt, a mallet, deodorant spray and a bed sheet. He had (laughs) he had spread the bed sheet in the driveway of his own home and armed himself with a rubber mallet, an aerosol can of Axe deodorant and a clothing oh, belt. God, he then hid behind a light pole across the street and waited for the victim to come running down the street as he regularly jogged. OK, so as soon as the jogger ran past the light pole, Logan Smith allegedly followed him, tossed the belt over his head until it was in the front of his neck. And then he proceeded to pull the ligature tight around the victim's neck for several seconds. Well, the jogger quickly realized what was happening and fought back, eventually overpowering the five foot, 10, 200 pound teenager. Well, you know, so it's funny because I was just kind of lounging around last night and there was a whole special on kids that kill. And they had a whole section on when Jeffrey Dahmer was yeah, kind of a late teen, maybe not a full on kid, but maybe like 19. But he but there was a doctor that he was obsessed with. This is after he attended a funeral where he masturbated after seeing a corpse. Uh, in, a, in a casket, but there's a doc, doctor he was obsessed with that he checked himself in like, I'm feeling bad. And when the doctor, he's like, I think I have a hernia. The doctor was examining him, you know, said Jeffrey had an erection and he's like, oh, maybe you got to leave. He was a little creeped out. But then Jeffrey would be waiting. He would see him jog every day, he became sexually obsessed. He wanted to lie. His whole thing is he wanted to lie down next to the doctor who was basically a zombie. So he was going to attack him with a well, this baseball is- bat. Logan Smith, he allegedly planned to use the mallet to hit the victim and the axe deodorant spray to spray him in the eyes before strangling him with the belt and then dragging the body on the sheet into his bedroom. He also he he admitted that he just he planned to play with the victim to fulfill his sexual. Yeah. Wow. He thought if he hit him in the closet, nobody would find him. uh, Again, a very Jeffrey Dahmer move. The closet. uh, The thing about the axe uh, deodorant spray, um, you know, the spray in the eyes, you just got to wear it. and You're fucking knocking people out. I mean, <laughs> fucking the douchebags that wear that stuff. I mean, boys, do you ever get laid with that? Because that shit's disgusting. All right. Uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, let's see. Okay. What's this guy's name? William Cronin was just uh, 
let's give there's a nine million dollar verdict against Cracker Barrel, the uh white trash granny <laughs> granny cafe yeah whatever that is i mean those, those they have a gift shop i don't know what the fuck's going on there he was going to a cracker barrel this is like a while ago this is this was going on for a while seven or eight years ago but they finally resolved it he asked for a glass of drinking water and they instead served him a glass of eco san which is basically this industrial cleaner and he it was clear and he just was probably yapping away and just took a massive swig of that and it basically caused permanent damage uh, it burned his mouth so badly his esophagus is fucked so he was rewarded nine million but that's outside of the punitive damage is like five million basically this guy got a shitload of money for drinking by just fucking up his whole system by drinking industrial cleaner the nine million though based in te- this was in tennessee they can only give him one million based in state rules because they i guess protect corporations but he got a, a bunch of others but he, well, he fucked up his whole. Uh, I mean, I've his, never heard of an esophageal replacement. That's just. I know be- he's fucked, buddy. He, yeah, he's got millions, but I don't think it's worth it. Next, <laughs> do you have a well, story? I-, I don't think this was worth it either. But leave it to those industrious Americans. An American man may never be able to use his penis again oh, after oh his boy. after his partner accidentally sprayed expanding foam up his urethra and a sex act gone gone wrong. The 45-year-old patient had to have a new opening cut between his scrotum and his anus to urinate when the foam hardened and became anchored in his penis. Uh. The unidentified man was struggling with impotence and had been inserting various objects into the opening of his penis during sex to stay erect. But things went horribly wrong during one of these sessions when the man's partner tried to use the straw of a can of insulation spray to keep him firm. But at some point, the partner accidentally hit the button on top of the can, deploying the foam inside of his penis. Now, the foam normally used for home insulation hardened and was left with several masses in the inside of his member and bladder. Urologist who detailed the incident and urology case report said the man waited three weeks to seek medical attention. He only went in for treatment after finding it increasingly painful and difficult to urinate genius yeah. yes by the time he arrived he was no doubt passing blood now Ugh. we we know sound devices i mean you know those beautiful metal tubes that are used to expand the your sounding which is becoming increasingly more popular is when you know men insert various objects into the opening of their urethra so medical staff managed to extract the foam from inside the man's bladder during surgery but the masses located in his penis proved more problematic. So <laughs> specialized tools, they tried to grab the foam and pull it out through the opening, but this proved impossible. It became apparent that he was suffering previous to this urethral stricture disease. It's when the urethra actually becomes scarred and it causes it to narrow. So the scarred tissue effectively anchored the foam in place, making the attempts to manually extract it through the oh, penis no. impossible. Anyway, following surgery, three tubes were inserted to help him pass urine and remove fluid, but no issues were identified after the operation. And the man is expected to undergo further surgery to repair his urethra, but only after a psychiatric assessment. Well, I wish Franklin well, because urethra Franklin, <laughs> I had to make that pun, All is right. not doing so well. I, I, that was, I think I think a psychi- psychiatric uh, well, evaluation I mean, most is men essential. Can't, most men can't stand the thought of a Q-tip up there, but some men like a little expansion in their sex play. Well, I mean, speaking of things not being erect uh, and having bad solutions around erect things or non-erect things, I'm trying to connect this here. Uh Todd Jones and Laurel Hoffman, they've both been arrested in Ohio because they decided to cut down a historic 250 foot walnut tree. Um, And then they so they weren't allowed to cut it down, period. It was like the cities or the town, some suburb of Cleveland. They they weren't allowed. They weren't given the permission to do that. But then, of course, they chopped it up and sold the timber, uh, which happened to be black walnut, uh, which is very valuable and was that the point of it this yeah yeah yeah. this is some this is some crackhead shit or something i don't know i mean yeah but it was a lot of work and and yeah i only got two thousand dollars at the end of the day and a a prison sentence yeah they're of course they're freaking out uh 
Jones said, this is ridiculous. There was no ill intent and all this stuff. But uh, yeah, you're not allowed just to pick any tree you see and just cut it down and sell it. But uh, it's not your tree. Leave the yeah. trees alone. Yeah, go, yeah. Go, go plant. Uh, go plant some trees. Stop chopping them down. Yeah, yeah. That, that was pretty did. dumb. Did you hear about the absolutely massive volcano eruption out, Tonga. outside near Tonga? And, and the volcano is called Hunga, uh, which was an underwater volcano. And uh, they said it was a kind of a once in a millennium eruption. Massive. I mean, and it, and it was and it happened to be it was kind of this perfect storm. The water was shallow enough that uh, it instantly vaporized the water around it upon the eruption. It just turned into this insane steam that was uh, th- th- that created shockwaves that traveled 60 miles up. It, it's maybe the one of the biggest ones ever recorded. But fortunately, the duration of the eruption was 10 minutes. It wasn't so long. It was just like this giant explosion. And it was just done. So it's not going to affect like usually when that something that big happens, like the average temperature of the globe goes down like a couple degrees for like a hundred years or something. So, but they say that's not going to happen. Maybe it'll, it'll go down a little bit for a year or so. Uh, can you can you imagine <laughs> you're in Tonga, in the middle of nowhere, thinking life is lovely and suddenly Hello. Oh, yeah. It, and it, well, it created it's a tsunami. Yeah, it, it created a tsunami. One, one, one fucking village got completely fucked. And then, but the, the, but the tsunami waves, I mean, they, they, of course, they notified Japan and, and the West Coast. I mean, they're not killing people outside of that area. But uh, if you can, if anyone can just check up the satellite images, it's, it really looks insane. It looks fucking insane. Kind of impressive. Very impressive. Like Kevin Reed uh, is being sued for manslaughter because of. Uh, the autopilot uh, feature on his Tesla. He decided just to like he was a limousine driver or whatever. I don't, I don't know. There's a Tesla limousine. I, I, I don't know how, what was going on. He was driving a Tesla and uh, he decided just to like just chill. You know, he didn't he watch didn't, some porno. I don't know. Who knows? But he did nothing. And then, of course, it went off. It, it was an old software, but it went off. Uh, it was in L.A., went off the freeway, went into some exit and it just blew right through a red light, you know, because he was just chilling out and it killed two people. So he's being charged with manslaughter. This is going to be interesting how this goes down. Um, and of course, with self-driving cars. So people are watching this case right now. Well, I'm telling you what case I'm watching. I'm watching Eugene Chadbourne's guitar case to make sure there's no electric rakes in there. Oh, I love the I love that pun in that transition. So our guest tonight on the Lydian Spin at Lydia Lunchtime Doll is Eugene Chadbourne. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and our special guest, the absurdly prolific Eugene Doc Chadbourne. Thanks for being with us. I want to read a little of what Quiet has had to say about you recently. And and anybody else that wants more information, I was very impressed with your website, but that it only goes up to 2015. It's so incredibly well documented. But having been on at least, at my last count, 358 albums from John Zorn and Jello Biafra, Violent Femmes, Camper Van Beethoven, Carla Bly, Hans Benick, Henry Kaiser, I'm just skipping around. They might be giants, half Japanese, Derek Bailey, Anthony Braxton. And that's only naming, you know, what rolls off the tongue immediately. Uh, played live consistently for decades, both on your on his own and in groups, performing everywhere from local record stores to the Soviet bloc. I will make the complaint here hereby that, yes, he is a cult figure. Sometimes it feels strange that you are not more widely, but are any of us revered. And to some extent, you like a lot of the guests on the Lydian Spinner, they like to call you a victim of your own inventiveness. So thank you very much for your time, Eugene. Doc Chadbourne. Last time I saw you it was either a recording session. It was the show we did with Weasel or it was in Trondheim, Norway. And we were drinking doll beer, the, the, the beer that has the same name as me. I think it was the recording session with the drummer that wouldn't stop playing. Yeah, who wait, who was that? That was uh right, let's not say his name. Right. Oh, but okay. but um yeah, I, that was really fun in Norway that you were with um Mendoza, yes. Yeah, Lydia uh not Lydia, Ava, 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 Ava,
was it Sam Osmovat on drums? I don't know. She's had a few drummers. I don't know. Anyhow, it's always great running into you all over the world because you're, or at least were up until the pandemic, traveling pretty frequently. And us being musicians, we just sometimes just, boom, we're there in the same place at the same time. And uh, and then I, sa- I found your little um, instrument and, and travel stash in that guy's house in Germany. That was really fun. I don't uh, know what you're referring Gun, to. Gunter, oh, Gunter, Gunter, Gunter Janowski. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Outside of Munich. Yes, it's like a, it's always good for all those people out there. If, you, if you're a traveling musician to have like a little, a little. Oh, I, like have a, stuff, I have stuff tucked away all over the place. Yeah, and exactly. Ho- like, who knows? Right, right. I exactly. don't think that either of you two have any little instruments tucked away. I have a feeling <laughs> if they're instruments, they're of a considerable girth. Oh, my God. No, so, no, no. It's more like merchandise and stuff. Weird uh, things. Clothing. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. I, 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 I know. I know. Clothing I, all over the place. You we have, have accessories. To. We have accessories all over. <laughs> but this this guy had run a music store for a long time. And then when he closed it, he just took everything that was left and put it in his basement. Correct. He has Correct. hundreds and hundreds of cases. All this stuff. I mean, I loaded up on all kinds of things. Well done. Because he's trying to get yeah. rid of it. He's trying to get rid of this stuff. So he's like, I know. take it. I know. I know. So as a traveling nomad, you just take things from one place, leave them in another, eventually come back to it. That's the way we have. That's the way it is. I'm I'm particularly obsessed about uh, uh, figuring out how to how to make like my guitar case five pounds lighter just by throwing away pieces of paper that I don't need. <laughs> no, I'm com- and I love unpacking and repacking stuff, and I really like arriving somewhere and and knowing oh I'm going to leave some things here and and, and get it and kind of organizing it. I don't know, kind of crazy. Well, just from what seeing what you're sitting in front of, it, you look rather organized over there. Well, I'm in my office. It's mostly like uh, uh, guitars everywhere, and I'm working on guitars. And uh, yeah, I run I run my little empire out of here. So I guess that's what you've been doing during this last insane, endless pandemic. So how did that first hit you, Eugene? I mean, we all reacted differently. It still seems to be going on. Did you find it a relief, or were you were you going a bit nuts for a while? Well, personally, I mean, I can really, I, I, I understand how for a lot of people, it was an incredibly horrifying, frustrating thing to be interrupted. But I had been um, playing guitar and running around uh, trying to do something with it since uh, 1977 was when I left my newspaper job and went off and did that. And I was determined to succeed with it. So, you know, I was just constantly moving around then when you're home trying to remember where things are and then getting organized again to leave and it was great to have a kind of a break from it and then it went on and on (laughs) but uh while it went i it was the first time ever that i've gotten any unemployment or anything when i'm not unemployed i'm not employed wasn't that fantastic i wish they'd start sending those checks out again well, they're talking about it. And then and then I uh, I was contacted by the Small Business Administration. Yes. I, I applied there and this guy took an interest in me. And that's really that helped me um, invest in a lot of guitars and get, get that <laughs> kind of going and stuff. So it, it was in uh, I I really was able to organize a lot of the. I think a lot of musicians actually, as much as they might not have liked it, I had no problem because I felt, although not as, not being on tour since 77, not as many shows as you've had, but still being on the road, I found it quite good. And I had already planned to do other things anyway. I think a lot of musicians kind of benefited financially from the pandemic. And I do hope they consider, you know, the impending poverty again. No, that's all been that that's all been OK. But I mean, it, the unpredictability of it and the danger of it is really creepy, and especially for little children. And and also the way people just kind of jump back into, like, Ooh, you know, it's it's crazy. And then, um, well, there was a, a typical example here in town. There was a there was a, a uh, an event for uh, somebody, an older woman that died that you ran a restaurant and in, in where there was a club where there was live music. And so this had gone on. She was a, a very beloved local figure. And so we decided to go to this reception and all these people were kind of like, oh, I just have to hug you. And, you know, oh, I know it's, it drove me crazy. And when I got out of there, it was like, well, I hope I haven't killed myself just with this. You know. 
How how long have you been there? Like when? Because I mean, you you grew up you grew up in Colorado, right? Or you're you're born in upstate New York. You grew up in Colorado. Well, you moved to Canada during Vietnam. I know that. Yeah, um, you got it really, down. really good idea as well. That really worked. Yeah, for me. I mean, I had two cousins that were were set to go into the Vietnam War, and they all also dodged it successfully. I just thought. Just a wrong, 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 wrong. Any way out, please. Very wise. Move. Well, it was a really, it was a really one of the smartest things my uh, father ever did was get us out of there. Um, especially me. Uh, my oldest brother had a medical deferment, and my uh, the other one too, kind of. And also, they had the, they were able to have these student deferments, but they dropped all that and. I, I had a high number in the lottery that were like, <laughs> yeah, because Canada, I always say, I think that Canada kept me out of the infantry. So hit the border whenever possible. Yeah. Yeah. So did you, you, know, did you go back to Colorado after your uh, stay in Canada? No, you know, by the time I was, I was getting ready to leave Calgary. I did, I worked at that newspaper and I'd done that. That was really an interesting thing, but I really wanted to play music and, and Mr. Braxton Really, oh, yeah. and he said you have to go to New York, uh, and and then you can become a professional. And, uh, but how and did you even run into Anthony Braxton? Well, I I knew his music. I was really excited by it. Very inspired. And um, this is when he was doing the solo saxophone concert. Mm -hmm. I arranged for him to do a concert at the University of Calgary at the Student Union by getting in touch with him and uh, through. Um, a jazz magazine that used to be published in uh, Toronto called Coda. I was involved with them. They were bringing him up to Toronto. He got on a plane. He went to Calgary. He had no idea where he was going. When they, <laughs> he said he looked down and saw these mountains and stuff. He said, where the hell are you? He said, well, you're, you're going past Montana. He had no idea where he was going. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he showed up and he just wouldn't let me alone about it. You have to make a record and you have to go to New York and oh, you have fantastic. to put out your own yeah. record. Nobody's going to do it for you. He gave me a lot of really great advice. Everything he told me was really great. And so I made this recording and I, and that was what I, I got, I've kind of got things started with that. I sent this recording out and then I kind of like, um, I decided to leave Canada and go back to the, uh, to the, to the States while I was still legally, uh, would be able to walk, go around without a draft card, you know? So I had to be really careful. I went back and um, basically kind of dropped in on everybody that had written me and told, told me they liked that record. But I kind of made a lot of interesting connections that way. And then I ended up, uh, just as I got to New York City, my oldest brother said, uh, oh, we have a roommate moving out so you could move in into our, they had a, a, a sublet place they were renting up um, in, on the Upper West Side. 72nd and uh, between Central Park West and nice. yeah, it was across the street from Robert Duvall and Paul <laughs> Simon. It was oh, yeah, a Paul nice Simon was there. Huh? It was a, some building, it is an apartment that belonged to a dentist. It was really kind of run down, but um, I mean, for you know how you're always hearing these stories about people come to New York and just fall into these great apartments and stuff. So that was a that was a good example of that. That must have been amazing. Uh, and what year was that? Was that in the 77? Yeah, 77, 78. And I, now I I remember going to a rehearsal. So I have this memory of going to a rehearsal space. At first, I thought it was with Zorn, but I think it was with this guy, Philip Johnston. But anyway, we went over there. And we ran into James Siegfried, <laughs> James <laughs> White, whatever. James Chance. Yeah. But this is when that you had, I think you were in this group, Teenage Jesus. That was my group, yes. And the Jerks. But I remember we had this interesting conversation. It's either Phil, so either Philip or John said, "Well, that guy's got a whole thing going now where they attack the audience and beat them up." <laughs> and I remember saying, "Well, we don't even have a first. Let's get an audience, someone to come to these things, and then we'll beat them up." <laughs> well, trust me, there wasn't many there, and it's but one one reason why the heat of James Siegfried and a chance had to form, had to be just you know, exiled from Teenage Jesus, which was much more of a cold, short stabbing frenzy. And he was more of an explosive heat. So one of my best decisions was telling James Chance to start his own band, which became the Contortions, which was just one of one of the greatest bands of the no wave period. 
at that time. So do you, did you guys ever formally meet until this uh, this Zoom right here? No. And yet you guys Not were hovering around literally the same blocks at the same time. It's kind of amazing, actually. Yeah, no, that's really. Yeah, but that's typical, I guess. Yep. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And did you uh, did you uh, hang with uh, Robert Quine, uh, you know, as a guitar fellow guitar player? Like, no, any, any I didn't know. I didn't know him. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember. I had, I ended up uh, I, I knew the DNA a little bit. Ardo Lindsay. But, but you fell in then with the lounge. Did you fall in with the lounge lizards at one point or that? Well, that I didn't that really clip. know. Yeah, no, I didn't. I mean, I knew. Yeah, I knew. Uh, well, I knew Ardo Lindsay. I don't remember. Right. Their, yeah, I didn't really know them very well. either. Uh -huh. So did you fall into the knitting factory scene when you got to? Well, New that York? happened later after I okay. went to North Carolina. Then suddenly um, I knew that guy from Wisconsin. He called me up. He said, I'm going to open up a club in New York. It's going to be like a club in Wisconsin. I said, oh, that's going to be neat, nice. <laughs> so anyway yeah but that was much that was much later yeah okay so when you first got here in 77 then what were you doing musically are we sniffing around uh you know i was you trying do? to i was trying to play jazz or free jazz avant-garde jazz i don't know what you would call it exactly but um i got i made friends with frank lowe the saxophone player he started playing with me and that was very strange situation to to be involved with but then i met zorn right away and we started doing all kinds of stuff mostly at his house yeah i was going to ask what the clubs were at that time because the clubs were very different uh from the discos the no wave scene the rock clubs and then the avant you know a lot of jazz lofts it was a very different um you know there was a lot of bisecting going on of different spaces also ja also in. jazz was in a weird place at that point i mean it's like yeah, yeah, the fusion, you know, free jazz was kind of like, well, where's that going? And then, of course, it's before the whole neo bop conservative Marsalis thing really kicked off. So it was a weird spot. I, I couldn't even imagine what, what it was like at the time. Um, I played at Studio Rivby with with Frank Lowe. So that was really that was really great. But I wasn't able to do anything much like that on my own. Um, uh, I'd made friends with Leo Smith. He 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 had me come and help him do us he did a solo concert at this place called the brook which was in chelsea i went and helped him do that he did it for two nights this was like the first year i was living in new york this was a lesson because to me because this this concert got a huge write-up in the village voice i gary giddens or somebody what a genius leo smith was and i think 10 people came over two nights so it was kind of like this is, i was like well this is going to be this is going to be tough you know to do this and now of course when we played at studio rivby during the sam rivers festival there was there was a, a mob of people there i mean some of those some of those events were really well attended but this place the brook it turned out to be so I rented it all so that you would rent these places. So I rented the place and did a couple of nights solo. And I managed to get enough people to show up. I don't know how, putting posters up or something, that so that I kind of broke even. And then I, uh, I started hanging around there because uh, I met Seth saxophone player Charles Tyler. It's really great. Albert Eiler's cousin. Amazing. And a wonderfully, a really funny guy. And he was playing every week for... Um, some dancers there it was Harry Streep, who was, of course, the brother of Meryl Streep. OK. <laughs> and um, and it, we didn't even know anything about it at that time. All we knew about was uh, she, we would say uh, he Harry would say, uh, my sister is married to this actor. He ended up dying. John Casales or something. Oh, he was great. He was. Yeah, a great he was actor. great. He was I'd in Dog Day in Afternoon. Movie. Dog Day Afternoon. Amazing. Yeah. As Al Pacino's partner that Al Pacino's robbing the bank for yep. the Godfather. He was an amazing, very unique character actor. Well, Harry, so Harry Streep and his and his girlfriend had this uh, would do this contact improvisation, and we did uh, improv improvised music with it. It was kind of fun to do. It was a, a place to go every one so one 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 night every week, and there'd be other music and other people came by, and then the other guy living in the loss uh, was. Frank Ferrucci was a 
uh, Latin jazz pianist. So I could have conversations with him about that music when I, when I wasn't really not playing that music. And there's no chance in hell I was going to get into a band like that in New York. But I was able to talk to him and look at charts and stuff like that. That's cool. So it was really, really interesting. Uh, just from that one place, I kind of stayed involved in that. And then after I'd been coming for and doing these things, then the next few times I did concerts, they just let me do a financial settlement at the end there was no rent you know but there were very few places i rem i remember i read this uh, old interview with steve lacy where he said he used to just walk block to block going into like a bakery and say could we play a gig here and we really talked about doing this zorn did, zorn had his living room to play in so he wasn't so crazy about doing that but we're always kind of looking around for places to play and it was really really hard other than renting places there really wasn't anywhere particularly to play there was a place in the village called someplace nice i remember that was also somebody's somebody's um living room a very strange fellow but also very nice you know kind of a philosopher and he would have um photography exhibits there and we did, and, we did. I, I, yeah, and again, this is like before the knitting factory, and some places opened up that oh, yeah. were more that were yeah. more, uh, you know, accepting to all kinds of things. But I also, mean, you guys had cultivated uh, that whole scene had cultivated quite a bit from when from those periods of just kind of like, hey, we're going to play to the arrival of the knitting factory. So it kind of was a, a few things lining up. It wasn't just like, hey, there's a place to play. It's like you guys suddenly had all the stuff behind you and all this experience and you were at a different place in, in your lives as well. So, well, it got much better when I left town, when I went and moved <laughs> to North Carolina, which was what, what year, that, what year was the that? very first summer? George Lewis calls me. I like to have your country band. By then I had this country. Oh. band, Right. And I said, Oh, I, I want the country band to play at the kitchen. So we did this job at the kitchen, which was like a really big deal. Yeah. You know, but I, I'd left. And then we started, you know, with Shockabilly, we started playing all these different clubs that opened in that time. And I'm sure you know all of them, you know, Danta Teria, Peppermint Lounge. We, one, we, you know, I think we, we got thrown off stage at some of them and other ones, you know, I don't think we ever got invited back. To <laughs> well, but finally, um, one summer, the, I, I don't remember the exact year, but the, like this place, for instance, I, I remember 8BC was the name of the place. Yeah. So eight, I remember playing Fright Wig from San Francisco, They Might Be Giants, and Shockabilly. And then another one of those bills there um, I, I was also with the Butthole Surfers. They arrived. <laughs> in the so, and, and, <laughs> That was like the place to be. I felt I yeah. suddenly that was a one summer. I felt like I am the guitar hero right now. <laughs> go. No, that was very popular. And a lot of people were going and you would look out and see all these like hip young people. So that was it, it went from, you know, having absolutely nowhere to play to, to that kind of situation. There, there was an interesting uh, many different kinds of clubs to play at at that time that started like, you know, post dance and tear round dance and Terry and Peppermint Lounge, Tier 3, 8BC, the Pyramid, Max's, CBGB's. And they all had a slightly different vibe or what they catered to. But places like 8BC, which was very late night and on between B and C, which was still rather treacherous at that point. But it, it allowed for just all kinds of things. I mean, it was, and, and as you were saying, you had to often curate your own shows. I had to, I started curating shows because that's what you just did. You just go and say, hey, can we play here? So so you, you arrived in New York, you, you wanted to play avant-garde jazz, but growing up in Colorado and then living in Alberta, I mean, is that where you kind of dove into country western and is that is what do you well, like i mean country and western was something that was on the radio all the time when i was okay. a kid they mixed everything together at that point you know you'd have buck owens and then you'd have the beatles and then you know roger miller and then the stones they mixed everything together so i i just really really liked it um in alberta though i was most i wasn't i was mostly listening to to avant-garde music avant-garde classical music uh, ethnic music just all kinds of weird stuff avant-garde rock music too right i mean you're into well, I mean, I, and, and I, i've been listening to rock and roll since i was a teenager and 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 we got into all this weird stuff you know mothers of invention and captain b fart and blah, 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 blah. but i was kind of sick of that right and um i then i went into other stuff and then i kind of got back into it later 
Yeah, interesting. I remember I was just thinking about Kramer playing me the a record of the birthday party at his apartment. That was and I'm like, like wow. <laughs> what uh, the hell? The birthday party live and on record were one of my favorite bands. I had the first two albums, but also the butthole surfers, early butthole surfers. Early butthole I surfers, yeah. Really love the early butthole surfers. I like some of their albums a lot too. I used to do this <laughs> thing um uh at some of the schools where i would go in and play different types of music and talk about recording and i always played that record with us with a <laughs> oh yeah 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 classic was that brown reason to live i i, I well with I, it, I, one I, of my favorite like powerless <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite titles for an album is cream corn out of the socket of davis meaning cream corn out of sammy davis's glass eye Oh, I just thought no. that was the best title ever. That you is talk- true. Thanks for explaining that. I always thought they were talking about Davis, California. <laughs> <laughs> you told me a story once um, in Colorado. You, you witnessed a cowboy throw a, a hippie through a, a window, right? <laughs> that was at Rogers Donut Shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That wow. was a scene of many, I of many things. I remember too. Uh, this was this would have been in um, uh, eight, ninth grade. I remember explaining the plot of two thousand and one Space Odyssey to two <laughs> girls, teenage girls who were tripping in that place. That might have been even the same night. <laughs> wow! All right, I've um, got to. I've got to just ask what what. What would be your favorite donut? Well, um, <laughs> I have to try to avoid them, but th- this, you know, this, so this same place earlier in my life, when I delivered <laughs> the newspaper, the Boulder Daily Camera, <laughs> in the cold winter of Colorado, in the early morning on the Sunday edition, after you deliver all those big Sunday papers, uh, in the snow, I would ride my bike and go over there and get, they would have these fresh cinnamon rolls. <laughs> that mm. was fantastic. I'm, I always, <laughs> I always like the mini donut holes, but that's like, I like two nibbles of a donut hole. I'm good to go. I don't know. Donuts are tough for me. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, one, one or two bites. What can I say? But I had to ask. Yeah. So you, you, you know, froze with that. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Well, yeah, you just you not, I, I want to go back in chronological order, but I do want to jump ahead for the moment. You just recorded uh, with Anthony Brax, and you you've been reunited after all these years, right? You just you, and uh, that's well. That's I mean, amazing. we never ever did anything. He would always talk about it. It was incredible. To, for then, it finally happened. It was great. Oh, beautiful! And this book, Dreamery. When did wait? When did that come out? Thousand page book. Weasel Walter bought it. He's like, I I got to get this thing. Well, <laughs> I should get that updated. Actually, the, the guy the guy doing that kind of ran out of steam. You know that is, but um. I, I do. Yeah, so so when did it, when when did this come out? Tell us about it. It looks fantastic. What is it? Like Twenty eighteen or something. Anyway, um, it was a collection of uh, writing down dreams um, for many many years, and then other things that I had written, kind of, and putting it all, figuring out a way to assemble it as a block. You know, something interesting, and um, it went through a lot of different um. At, at one point, uh, I was on tour with uh, the banjo player, Tony Trishka. We went through Lawrence, Kansas, and we decided we were going to, we got an invite to go visit William Burroughs. So um, after that, I was like, you know, this is really a great man and had great ideas. And I should just take my manuscript and cut it up and put it back together. So I did that. That was an interesting process. And then I gave that uh at my, that point, my father was still alive. He, he was a literature professor. He liked reading stuff. So I gave him this manuscript to look at. He turned around and realized what had happened with it. And he had, he cut it back up and put it back together. He restitched <laughs> it. Wow. So how long he was that? It. How, how long was that in the making? But that was years. That was that was a very early uh attempt at uh, doing this and then I finally kind of I really finally got it going with the um with the dreams and um it was really a, the, the funnest process for me is that I would be writing it especially on tour it's something you could do on tour in a hotel really rather than get in trouble at night and so there you there I am uh I'm thinking I get to well I'm going to go to bed now and I don't know how to connect this and this 
And then that night I would have a dream that would connect them perfectly. So. Wow. So you, you basically manifested, you, you were looking for the solution and you, and you somehow realized it in a dream world. I, that's, that's impressive. It's really, it really fun. It, it's just fun to put together a really big, a really big book too. But you, you can solve some problems in your dreams. I mean, there's, there is actually an exact science about this. I used to write some of my speeches in my sleep. I mean, I would just, and I have very strange sleep patterns, but I think you could do a lot of work or, or figure some things out. I mean, you know, besides just the analyzation of your own dreams, uh, you know, the body is resting. The brain can go into overtime sometimes. Oh, it, it hands you stuff. I, I, I had this dream in Australia that I was looking at this, was basically a page with some chord changes on it. So I will write, <laughs> write them down. Yeah, it's like they just hand you things. It's great. Well, how, I have to, how, much, how, much, how much does that thousand, that thousand page weigh? Does that weigh about 10 pounds? No, actually, I think this weighs um, uh, 3.2 pounds. Oh, okay. Whoa, okay. So All right. Hefty, hefty. <laughs> yeah, no, getting them around on tour was like an oh, an my army God. expedition. Uh, I'm going to give you an idea here, Eugene, that, for instance, what about just making a paperback sized book and inside it is a USB with all the thousand pages on it. And that would only be about six ounces. That's Just a really thought. great idea. That's not a bad idea, right? That's a great idea. I had I had one friend when they first came out with these USB sticks. He was like, "This is going to replace everything." But that, you can get all kinds. But well, I really get, like. I think they're very useful. That's you can really get all idea. kinds of designs on this USB, and you can get all put all kinds of things in there, and they don't. Oh, like it's incredible! Yeah. Two pounds to carry around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But people really like and to settle that back with a nice big book. I like to have I like to have a book in my hand. I mean, we we have no choice but to read a lot of stuff via the computer or whatever. But I have to say, there's nothing like the smell, especially oh, of an God. old yeah. the smell of a book, the heft of a book, or the the lack of heft of a book. Sometimes, I have to say, I, I'd like to stick my nose in a book. You know what's so weird about the smell of books? If you go to a bookstore that sells new books, it has a very specific smell. And if you go to a used bookstore, I'm not talking about imbibing just people smell but there's a specific right. oh, yeah. book smell also and i don't know what happens in that transformation i, I you know it's uh i, I guess opening the, the, size, the size thing um <laughs> i did this book um i thought oh maybe i made it too big i made it di you know here i am i'm carrying these around on the train you know like i mean <laughs> torturing myself with this so i thought well the next book I'm not going to make it as big. But then I'm thinking, then people are going to go, hmm, he's running ah. out of ideas. Look at this book. It's only this big. You know, people are. So I'm not sure. Ah, uh, <laughs> you know, you never think about them when you're creating your great masterpieces. Yeah, you just, you can't, you can't think about. It. If you started thinking about what the audience want, you'd, you'd shoot yourself. No, yeah, shoot, shoot the audience. Uh, forget yeah. about it. Eugene, uh, did I read something about an electric rake? <laughs> That yes, was, that's unfortunate. You know, um, to, uh, that's an example. You were just talking about um, the, the dealing with the audience and people not really caring about the brilliant things you do. But if you do something really stupid, people love it. And that's a that's a <laughs> that's a that is a great example. And um, so uh, when I came down here, I'd been uh, messing around with these contact mics for a few years. That was one of the things we used to do, making um weird noise, you know, uh, especially like holding the guitar pick against this contact mic when you're playing and all kinds of weird things. But anyway, um, I never had, I never did much raking when I lived in New York, but I got down to North Carolina right away, raking up leaves and this rake broke. And this, you know, I had, I looked at this and I'm like, this, is, this would sound great with a contact mic. And I took it down to the club that night where I was playing and put it through the fuzz box and everything. And, People went absolutely wild. And it became like a, <laughs> yeah, it became like a big thing. People really enjoyed it. Well, I want to go back uh, to what you said, because I, my question is always, how stupid do you have to be? Because sometimes you have to come up with the stupidest things. I mean, if you look around about what's really popular, I'm not just talking in our world. I'm saying in the world in general, what the hell is really popular is some of the dumbest shit we could never even imagine. I know they even when you, I, one summer, I think the most popular movie was called Jackass or dumb shit. <laughs> I mean, we couldn't make it any any more clear. No, but I, I, I on one hand, this is was kind of a fun uh, 
it, it reminded me of uh, some of the my friends that did performance art. Um, rather than concentrating on being like a hot musician, uh, you could make noise with this thing and people really enjoyed it. And of course, it really, uh, some people really got upset by it. And then it led to other homemade instruments, <laughs> like toilet plunger, <laughs> various <laughs> things. And then, of course, there's all kinds of people doing this. Uh, over the years, it was amusing. I remember this guy that was, I mean, my I never did a great technical achievement. You know, we would take a contact mic and duct tape it to a broken rake. That was it. It was nothing beyond that. But I remember this guy made these really elaborate guitars. One, he took like a broom and he put a uh, pickup on it, and then he was playing Dust My Broom. <laughs> and I remember this guy turned to me and said, Sovati has a pickup on a broom. It sounds like a guitar. <laughs> I, anyway, uh, it's a whole kind of weird uh, scene. Well, what, have, you, have you ever had a, the cigar box guitars? Well, I know I've seen them. Like, to They're me, amazing. Seen, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you want to play a, a certain type of music, yeah, that's like a whole kind of a, especially like four string open chord. Uh, do you guys oh, have oh, one? Is, is anyone playing them in your in your band? Uh, <laughs> no, I, yeah. well, I mean. I, I don't think, I think that would last for about one note with Weasel Walter playing guitar. Uh, <laughs> no, no, but, it, but in the UK, there was this Australian artist that had a seven piece group with these tin guitars that were all beautiful. And really the sound was, when you have seven of them going, it was pretty interesting. And mostly, you know, some good old fashioned backyard blues would sound great on these things. Oh yeah, that's what they're really great for. Absolutely. I saw a group play a whole set uh, on with using amplified vegetables. Wait! I, I've, seen, I've seen all kinds of cra crazy stuff. Uh, that's fun to be uh, involved with that. Uh, when I, I went to uh, uh, Tasmania for this festival, right? And the same one we did. Yeah, we, that, the yeah, Mofo Mo one? Yeah. It's a fantastic festival. So the, my fa one of my favorite things was I did this uh, three or four different workshops at the Conservatory of Music. And one of them was making uh, homemade instruments. And Brian went out and got all these pickups. So all we had uh, pickups everywhere. It wasn't like, oh, I can't make an instrument. I don't have a pickup. We had like tons of pickup. And these people brought stuff from there. It was kind of like, oh, I can, this is a chance to clean out my garage. I'm going to bring this crap over there. And he's going to make an instrument out of it. But the thing that was unique they had was these rabbit traps. Nice. Okay. Oh, and we I'm set up a whole in thing now. in the front. Yeah. Yeah. These amplified rabbit traps and played an, <laughs> an improvisation on that. Uh, and that was like an experience that will never be repeated. Well, <laughs> it's, it's funny because, you know, Yusef Latif hand, uh, years ago handed me uh, a bamboo and he, he didn't. He goes, now drill as many holes as you want. And he basically was he's like, OK, make make this flute. Now and, and put them in random spots. So you know, it's gonna be all this microtonal stuff. He goes, now write a piece for this instrument you just invented. And it, it was just kind of the idea of just letting go of these uh these constructs and, and really just throwing yourself into the spirit of music like that. It really comes it, it it's amazing what that can achieve. Um it, it's uh yeah, it, it definitely keeps you on your creative toes, I would say. Yeah, you, going, going back to the electric broom, it made me just think of one of the dumbest invention ever, which was an absolute huge smash hit. And and every few years as a comeback is the hula hoop. Oh, yeah, the hula hoop. Well, you know, <laughs> the, hula hoop. The, the worst thing I came across, I think, as a parent <laughs> was the slip and slide. Well, that could be, you mean a slip and slide into fucking the emergency room? I mean, well, that no, <laughs> because everyone's having an absolutely it reminded me, have you ever used a, a post hole digger? Hey, wait, 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 a what? A post hole digger? Like I haven't, I, I have to say, Eugene, I'm not yet. I haven't. But well, I so it's a similar you can show kind of me when I <laughs> So you suddenly have this thing where you're using these muscles you never use and you're going along and the kids are doing this on their stomach. And then two hours later, they're in agony. Like, oh, my stomach really hurts. So, yeah, it's that's uh, the hula hoop. I, that <laughs> came hula, I a hula huge invention. Always, very successful. I, I mean, I, I'd say the electrified slinky would be maybe my next instrument. We did, I did a lot with it, but that would get tangled up. And yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's going to be a hot. That's the amplified hard, slinky was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so you did that. All right. Okay. Another one, um, one of the most obnoxious percussion instruments, right? The flexitone. 
You know uh, that? Wee, 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 no. Wee, wee, wee. no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, yeah. That amplified was really horrifying. That's what you call a lot of time on your hands, and you need to fill them with something. Well, but so the, the actual peak of this thing with the electric rake happened because they had this event in Greensboro called City Stage, which was like the downtown was closed at six or seven stages and they had just music all day. And there would be a headliner, you know, the Turtles or the Love and Spoonful, Merle Haggard. The, one year, one of the headliners was Dizzy Gillespie and they had Shockabilly played before him. Whoa, okay. It was right downtown Greensboro. And I think this is the biggest crowd I've played for in Greensboro downtown, other than when I played with the Violent Femmes a few summers ago when they came through. And they played, uh, they, they played also a similar kind of thing. They closed off a street downtown and had a show. And there's just people everywhere, right? And I played that electric rake. <laughs> and the new one of the local channels, news <laughs> channels, filmed it. And then along comes this like New Year's, you know, where they they suddenly like we'd like to give this uh, year noise pollution award, to Eugene. <laughs> and they showed this clip on the news with me playing the electric rake, and then the newspaper did a write up on it, and every yeah, everybody was like, I would be. Uh, but one of the worst things was uh, they I was playing at the. Um, Winnipeg Folk Festival. <laughs> it sounds terrible. Sounds terrible already. Some guy, this guy had like really um, gone uh, to a great extremes to get these folk festivals in Canada to book me because they thought I oh he doesn't play folk music you know but so I'm booked at this thing and um, but they they can't, I was at this event that event but not on the main stage they kept me off the main stage. But um, so there was one event where I was playing the um, electric rake and, at the uh, folk festival. So this was like I, play, I can't remember what the circumstance was, but I got so annoyed at some of the workshops uh, that I decided, well, I'm going to play the electric rake at this one, just make a lot of noise mm -hmm. and um, see how mm -hmm. these other people deal with it. I mean, Billy Bragg was there, for instance, and um, the guy that ran the festival comes up to me at the dinner later that day. I think we'd like to make a room for you on the main stage playing your electric rake. And I'm like, Whoa. You know, I can write like a beautiful song or something or some, you know, a protest song, anything that would fit in with folk music. Just great. I can do that. Great. But no, they want some stupid thing, you know, with the with the electric, and they want to portray present me as like a clown with the electric. <laughs> so I said no. I said I'll come up there and play the guitar or the banjo, but not that damn thing, you know. It's so that was so. so this this is like a, a a weird inverse of Dylan going electric in in, in Newport, <laughs> where I so the, the response was like we want this, and then you're like no, like you're just being contrary every step. That's really funny. Actually. Have you ever? Well, appeared so at another the funny thing is that so I got kind of tired of it. I stopped doing it. They they uh, got uptight with the airlines, how much stuff you could carry. <laughs> that kind of got turfed out. But um, so yeah, how do you explain that thing to the, the airlines? Last, in the last few years. Uh, I did some driving tour, long driving tours, and you know, especially to sell my book and go around with and your play. donkey and car, with your go. donkey cart. I thought, okay, I'm going to pack my rake because that was popular, <laughs> and maybe I'll revive it. And no matter how many people talk about it and go, oh, did you bring your rake? And the rake can be on stage. Nobody really asks for it or anything. So I would go through the whole tour without ever playing it. Actually, interesting. Well, so. If you're standing there and expecting a request, like a shout out, like is it the Eugene Chadbourne like jukebox, break out the electric ray. Come on, we're, we're waiting for the rake all night. Well, yeah. Eugene, <laughs> so Eugene, basically all your ray, electric rake stories are positive ones. Seems like it's universally liked. Did you ever have any reactions where people are just put them in a rage or or <laughs> I mean, they're like they're like they're like freaking out like a bad ass drip, like no man. Well, one one re one reason I stopped doing it was I was doing this concert in Leipzig, and this very nice couple I like was there, and you know I'd known them for a few years. Now they had a little baby, and they brought the baby to the concert, but they had to take the baby outside during the rake because <laughs> they thought it could damage his ears. Aww. And I thought, well, I don't really want to do anything that would damage a baby's ears. That's a why do I need to do that? There's so many things I can do with <laughs> with music. Well, so, I don't want to do any concerts that have babies at them, though. I don't know. I, that's just <laughs> the way I feel. Keep the babies at home. <laughs> but My music is supposed to hurt babies' ears. You know the old, you know the uh, place in in Amsterdam, the Bim House, the old. Yes. 
the oh, old yes. one uh, that was on the Outishans Canal. So yeah. there was a concert there. It was a double bill with me and, and Fred Frith. Okay. And I was sets. playing the electric rake. Okay. And a man got so upset. Right. The dodge, the dodge. On the stage and disconnected it. And I was walking no. around playing the chairs and stuff. So he was able to just unplug it. <laughs> and it was, a, I thought it was very, very funny. Um, Fred still talks about it all the time. It, it's, uh, it's so insane when that happens. Like, so what was his reasoning? Was he, uh... well, he just hated it. And I mean, I don't blame him. It sounds horrible. Uh, and then his wife, so his wife comes backstage <laughs> and she said, uh, I'm really sorry that he did that. I'm very embarrassed. I said, I don't care. It's a crazy thing. And he, he did it. It was kind of fun. The audience enjoyed it. I said, if he'd interrupted the concert, I said, but the concert was about over anyway. Who cares? It's funny. Uh, and uh, and she said, I'd like to buy him uh, one of your CDs. <laughs> and I, said, but not, I said, but not well, but not one with the rake on it. But you never put the rake on a CD because there's no point. You know? Eugene, I have to say, there's many guitar players. I felt the need that I wanted to run up and unplug, but I've never wanted to unplug a rake meister. Oh yeah, well, I mean, can, that, 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 you, that's, can, that's, you can rake me anytime, my friend. Just that, that's actually it. happened to me. It's actually <laughs> happened to me playing my own instrument. Me and Peter Evans were playing, and some woman had a nervous breakdown, and she ran on stage and unplugged everything. It was it's, it's so weird when that that actually happens. Uh, when did you pick up the banjo? Oh, um, about 1980. Well, you know, I had one in high school. I remember having one at one point. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, I got interested in the banjo when I saw the movie Bonnie and Clyde. Nice. And, uh, and uh, not deliverance, not deliverance. Bonnie and Clyde. Okay. No, deliverance was late, much later. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, yeah Bonnie yeah. and Clyde. And also when I went on tour with Tony Trish guy, so I asked him, I, when did you start? He said, I started out with pedal steel. I said, when did you start playing the banjo? He goes, when I heard, saw Bonnie and Clyde. So, Cause it had this incredible uh, Earl Scruggs soundtrack. Did you know the banjo was Archie Shep's first instrument? <laughs> Uh, no. Yes, yes. That's quite surprising. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In Florida. I, think. I wish I'd known that when I was sitting in a restaurant and he was across the room and I didn't know it. I would have loved to make conversation with him. That oh, would yeah. be something he wasn't expecting. Probably not I at understand. all. I, the banjo was your first instrument. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was I was wondering if you've ever been to the International Noise Festival that Rat Bastard in Miami. Oh, you should go. No, no, I, I did. Uh, I, I did meet him and uh, do he put on a couple of events the last time I was in Florida. Quite the character. Oh, <laughs> yeah. we talked to him yesterday. We we love the rat. Yeah, he's his character. Absolutely. <laughs> so what's the plan? Like, are you once it just seems like things aren't spreading? I guess once we I guess not synthetically hit her immunity through vaccines, but I guess naturally. And that could be years. Are you just hitting the road immediately? What, what, where do you see? I don't have it. The only thing I have on the books is this stuff that's going on at the stone that's rescheduled from 2020. And that's supposed to be in June of 2022. All right. I, I have something. So we're looking at maybe being able to do that, you know. So we'll see. Hopefully we can. But, you know. They've already got a lot of rules about it, it has to be half. Full. Because, because the new the new stone is at the new school. Yeah. it's at the And new so school. so it's not really. It's not really Zorn's uh, call. It's it's more the the school, I think, right? The school set down certain regulations. I mean, yeah. they seem re everybody's going to be tested, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, then you have to weigh in everything else. With uh, going on tour already is absolutely nuts. It's like this is the last thing you need is to factor this in. Well, in November, I went and did some concerts in uh, Detroit where they had an art exhibit for me. You know. And um, I went there and we also I went with a bass player to play in Grand Rapids and everything was OK, but I kept it kind of really limited. We've been to we did some touring with retrovirus in September. I went to Europe for six weeks in October and I was just surprised to still be negative. And I'm so happy I had the perfect timing for that. But we had that little pocket there in October and November. And now it seems like we're back to, you know. Hibernation. And it seems that the kind of things we would do in Europe going across the borders all the time. I just don't understand how you'd pull that off these days. You know? Well, yeah. I, I mean, it was interesting because Switzerland and Spain were the most 
strict about it, which was fine by me. I mean, I had my vaccinations. I had every, you know, yeah, but you do have to get special pieces of paper. But the thing is, I mean, I just can't believe they let people on domestic flights without vaccinations. I just can't believe that. I mean, that's to me part of the problem here. It's like, come on, people. I'm sorry, but, you know, spread spread it to yourselves. <laughs> So the two of you actually have a connection in the sense that uh, you both can be political in your art as well, uh, not just, uh, I mean, am I wrong? <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 I mean, is that something you uh, explore anymore, Eugene? Uh, I mean, d- didn't, I mean, you said you, you used to do, am I wrong about that? You used to do kind of more no, I, I, I like protest that. I mean, music. It, and yeah, all it, it, I think all of it, I think, do, you know, doing anything creative in this place is, is uh, political, but uh there's a lot of uh i like political comedy kind of in music that was something i i really admired like when i would see phil oaks that he i was like i want to be like that you know i want to make everybody laugh about the war you know for a moment or cry or something he moved people so you know that that's a, a powerful thing and it's kind of uh you know i have my own little niche kind of with it but i don't i don't like to like um concentrate on it all the time and then it, it, it annoys me like I, I remember like the height of being annoyed was like people saying when are you going to write a song about monica lewinsky oh my god oh my god <laughs> it's like oh, it was, uh, well well uh you know right now it's nice to take a mental break from the horror of the political nonsense we've had in the past few years but you know the grand thing about you know working with tim on this podcast is because there wasn't that many shows to do spoken word. And I've been speaking about the war since I opened my fricking mouth because it is never over and I can't get off the politics. So this podcast became a way, especially during the orange ass clowns reign of terror to get our, to get some, you know, political tirades going, including a commercial I did called dump Trump. Uh, Trust me. It was a highlight of my career. It's still on YouTube. (laughs) Anyway, Eugene, I think that, you know, we could talk to you for the rest of our lives and it would be a joy. Of course, I'd have to break out my electric chair and do maybe a Zoom duet with you on the electric rake while I'm hula hooping. Because, yes, I can do the hula hoop. How do you think I got my hips like this, honey, is my hula hoop? I never was very good at it. (laughs) uh, I'm giving private lessons on Zoom and they're very reasonable. We can discuss that later. But thank you so much for talking to us. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, Eugene Chadbourne. Check out his 1,000-page book, his website, and his multiple recordings with uh, so many people, it's not even funny to list them. And just absolutely an American icon of grand weirdness. I thank you for existing, (laughs) my friend. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) <laughs> Pleasure seeing you, Eugene. Um, hopefully yeah, for doing this. In, in the physical world at some point, not too far away. 